On June 10th, 2014, a massive reveal was made. After years of fan speculation and small hints from the developers, finally, it was happening. IJ Anuma sits and talks for a while before clicking his fingers and Hyrule appears behind him. A short teaser plays unlike anything we've ever seen from the series. That game wouldn't come out until 2017, in which it went from literally being called Zelda U to being a Switch launch title. Of course, I'm talking about Breath of the Wild. I have a complicated relationship with Breath of the Wild. It took up until recently for me to properly appreciate it, to fully understand what it means to me. For a while I was extremely cynical about it, thinking it had ruined my favourite franchise of all time. But don't worry, Nintendo is doing that just fine themselves! Thanks Miyamoto. Very cool. Now I see Breath of the Wild for exactly what it is. A beautiful game that inspires the exact same sense of adventure that Ocarina of Time did for me as a kid. It's one of those interesting things where, as a child, games just feel bigger, grander, more real. Hyrule to me felt like a real place, and not a big, closed-off, grassy basin. It's hard to see that old way now. Hyrule slowly stopped being a living world, and instead became a linear sequence of trials to be overcome. But Breath of the Wild fully revitalized that thing that magic. As you can imagine, when a direct sequel was announced for the game, I wasn't very happy. A game I already didn't like at the time was getting a direct sequel, a rarity in and of itself in the Zelda series. However, that game released this year! <laughs> And I loved every single second of it. It was the callus to me for giving Breath of the Wild and re-examining Ocarina of Time, rediscovering the artistry in a work that had just become a game to me, something that I had come to understand only through technical terms and speedrun tricks, and not through narrative and metaphorical analysis. Thank you, Anuma, and all the other people working at Nintendo EPD. Let's not forget that these sorts of video games aren't just made by singular figureheads, but teams of talented people who deserve your utmost respect. Very cool. Miyamoto is still single-handedly to blame for every bad decision the Zelda series has ever had, however. Fuck you. Tears of the Kingdom itself as a game isn't solely responsible for my Zelda reawakening, but instead, it was the wait for it. No, that was the end of the sentence. Distance only makes the heart grow fonder, and in the meantime between Breath and Tears, there was a little commotion being made about another game. One that would consume my brain for three whole years. Years. I'm Kai from Kai's Home for Aspiring Vampires, and this is Genshin Impact. More like Genshit. Uh, um, ah, uh, fuck. Yeah, really showed you, Mihoyo. On September 20th, 2020, Chinese game studio MiHoYo published a little ditty called Genshin Impact. I was there. Not exactly at day one, but pretty close. Now, I have to exclaim, some may see this video as being overly negative, but if anything, it's biased in the game's favour, as apparently I'm the CEO of MiHoYo. Before the game's release, it had caused a small stir for looking a bit similar to Breath of the Wild, which is unfair. It looks a lot like Breath of the Wild, in ways that would be really easy to disguise if they wanted to. No, you see, I had finally found the cure to my sickness. Breath of the Wild on my phone, PC, and PS4? Fucking sign me up! Cowboy. I started with the PC version and it took a minute to install, but once I finally did, the opening cutscene uh, broke. Not a great start. Then I chose one of the two genders, girl boss and twink. I was on my merry way to softlock myself instantly because I set the controls to controller instead of keyboard, but it didn't work and there was no way to exit out of it, and I generally considered uninstalling the game because what the fuck else am I supposed to do until I somehow fixed it. But none of that mattered. Sure, I just probably had the worst first experience of a game since fucking big rigs, but I was instantly captured. The world was big and vibrant, and unlike Breath of the Wild, this game leans way more into the fantasy aspects of it, which I'm sorry, but I just prefer. Put magic back in Zelda 2K23. Please. Also, I cannot prove this, and I feel like I'm going insane, but I swear to god, in the settings, instead of saying off or on, it said close and open, which also just didn't look great and had an air of unprofessionalism, but I still was too enthralled to care. Please tell me someone else remembers this? Any day one gen shitters in the audience? Regardless, I was genuinely loving it. There was variety, things to do, places to see and discover, and a big dragon to fight, and I genuinely thought it would end there, but it didn't. There was so much more, I practically lived in the game. I played it every single day, and then I stopped. One day, I just didn't. And I didn't pick it up again after. Not for a long time. 
time. Why? Now, I'm more of a story and art direction person, however, I would be remiss not to talk about it in a video about a game. Imagine making over an hour long video about a game without mentioning the gameplay once. I wonder who would do that, ha 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 ha. Genshin Impact does not feel like how it looks. It looks like it would feel like Breath of the Wild. But Breath of the Wild is, uh, good. The characters of Genshin Impact are significantly stiffer and just off. It never feels like they're actually standing on the terrain in a way I can't fully describe. Link has a lot of dynamic animation. Just simple stuff like how his arm can move regardless of what animation is being played. We can see this clearly in animations like whistling, which could be done standing or running or whatever. Link also has this hot, juicy piece of tech called IK rigging. Most importantly, IK legs. This is why Link forms to the terrain, or can grab onto things properly while climbing. Sometimes you'll see his arm reach out more, for instance, and of course, he bends his legs on the appropriate terrain. These are small details, but it really helps in feeling like you're controlling a living, breathing person. What sells the idea that you're out there on an adventure trekking across the world and fighting monsters, and not just sliding your player underscore Hutau across the X and Z axis on your way to reduce the HP value of a collection of Ent underscore Hillichurl. Genshin Impact actually does have IK legs, but seemingly only on the idle pose, when it is the least important. None of the action poses like running or fighting seemingly use them. You can stand somewhere and have your leg awkwardly form to the environment, but the second you do any animation, including the idle animations, you start floating or clipping through the ground. Fucking nice. In general, the game doesn't really feel like it was designed with the movement in mind. Instead, it feels like they designed the environments first, and then threw in climbing later because Breath of the Wild has climbing. Most of the game is constructed around giant rock walls that are clearly not built with climbing in mind given how often you get stuck, caught on something, beat an overhang, or just run out of stamina. Lots of places have climbing outright disabled. It really is just a situational convenience, not a major mechanic. This also applies to gliding, but gliding is marginally more useful. But again, a lot of Genshin Impact has you on flat paths with minimal room for gliding outside of climbing up somewhere high, which as we established can often be tedious. A major reward for exploring is not having to do it again. The warp points in the game are fucking everywhere and if you have enough of them you really don't have to walk anywhere at all. I know that Breath of the Wild is also populated with warp points, but they're not just that. You either have to work for them or if they're just out there, they work more so as a checkpoint. After unlocking a shrine, you might not be ready to complete it yet so you can return to it later. It just also doubles as a warp point. Even at that it feels like the shrines still make you walk to where you need to go more often and aren't so common. The war points on the other hand have no challenge at all and just serve to reduce the amount of exploration necessary which really doesn't help in making the world feel alive. Treasure is also just scattered around semi-randomly, just kind of standing there. Whereas in Breath of the Wild, sure, while there is stationary treasure, there's a lot more dynamism going on. Chests buried under dirt and rubble, floating downstream through the water, may be lost from a shipwreck. It's just the small things. This isn't to mention half of Genshin Impact's treasure is just there and openable until you defeat enough dudes. Now, this is also in Breath of the Wild, but it's typically in a more natural way, nestled within enemy camps to give the player multiple ways of dealing with them, even at their simplest. They don't just unnaturally stick out and spawn four slimes so you can get the treasure. In general, a lack of interesting ways to engage is one of the major problems with the game. The literal only option you have is to engage with issues head on and exactly how the game intends. With absolutely no room for experimentation, each quest is designed so linearly and rigidly. The highlight of Breath of the Wild and especially Tears of the Kingdom was that it presented you with a problem and then shrugged, left you on your own to figure it out and get shit done. Genshin Impact is the exact opposite. It is absolutely no dynamism. Everything is static and scripted and controlled and just blunt. Players are given no freedom, which makes you wonder, why even make it an open world? Why bother? Your design suits linearity way but Oh my god, I wrote Peter in the script. Your design suits linearity way better. Breath of the Wild has things like stealth, using your environment, learning your enemy's behavior, and exploiting that to your advantage. Each individual mechanic is somewhat simple, but combined it adds up to create a unique and in-depth combat experience. However, doing it the other way is fine too. By not focusing on any of the other things, maybe it means they got the combat just right, putting so much attention and care into making it fun and rewarding. I wonder if that's what they did. I need to come clean. Originally this video was going to be a bit different. It was going to be a direct one-to-one -one comparison between Ocarina of Time and Genshin Impact. But I realized that it was a reductive lens to look through for the game. But, uh... 
Guess I'm doing that again. Oh, Kai talking about Ocarina of Time again? Who would have guessed? By 1991, the Zelda formula had been set in place. After a bit of a fuck up with the sequel, it generally seemed as though Zelda had firmly found its footing, with how it controls getting more refined naturally from game to game. Not you. However, there was just a bit of an issue. 3D was becoming a thing. It was all the rage, fucker. If you weren't 3D, you didn't matter. Take that, uh, Klonoa. However, the third access added a lot more issues and put a lot more of a burden on the player. They had so much more to deal with now. Everything was necessarily more complex. A big issue was ever actually hitting a fucking thing. In 2D, it's very simple. You just walk up to the guy and then you hit him. In 3D, though, there are so many different angles that something could be at. Games would have to take a lot more liberties and implement a lot more shortcuts to keep their games as accessible. In Sonic Adventure, Sonic was given the homing attack to make jumping at enemies just as easy as it was in 2D. When it came to Ocarina of Time, however, it had a different idea. Z-targeting. It was new. It was perfect. It was hot. Sexier than a big robot pirate fox. I have to stop doing this. This should not be a running joke. Why do- Z-targeting is so standard and invisible in games that it often goes underappreciated. It can be seen cropping up basically everywhere. Ocarina of Time wasn't exactly the first to have a lock-on feature, I'm sure there was some before, but it was definitely the most notable example, and a damn good one. They basically got everything right first time. It's only the highest rated game of all time or something, I don't know if you know anything about- How does it work? Pretty simple. Due to how difficult it is to get exactly where you need to be in 3D, Z-targeting orientates you into the correct direction of whatever you targeted. Pretty simple, right? Well, what if I told you- Yeah, so, for some- God forsaken reason that I cannot fathom, Genshin Impact goes, eh, and disregards an innovative piece of design and instead has this. The game seemingly randomly decides what to target for you as you press the attack button, which means that individual attacks are what lock on, not a separate targeting feature. This might not seem that bad, but the second you stop hitting the attack button, you are no longer locked onto your target. Why? This is terrible! It only directly works to reduce the agency of the player. You cannot choose who to attack. This was the best part of Z-targeting, giving the player the agency they expect while automating the most tedious parts. And they literally perfected it first try. That is if you're using hold in the settings. If you play Ocarina of Time with Switch, you're doing it wrong. You need to switch up your choices. While I'm here, holding hands with your dad? Or maybe a big, hot pirate <laughs> Alright, so sure. Some games have no targeting as a deliberate decision, like those recent Arkham-style brawler games where characters lock onto enemies automatically. However, there is a major difference. In these games, the character gracefully glides from enemy to enemy. You also get to see who you're targeting clearly before you attack. Not only that, but these games typically have a way to counter. When an enemy comes up behind due to the fact that you can't actually target them specifically, the game allows you to counter, typically by indicating beforehand, giving you an opportunity to fight back if you time it correctly. Genshin Impact doesn't. There is no real indication that an enemy is about to attack, and no way to actually directly counter. It's also just got not enough enemies to truly be a beat them up slash hack and slash brawler fucking character action game. What a stupid genre name. It is just more player agency removed, more automation. Instead of a counter or parry or even an actual fucking dodge button, your sprint button doubles as a dodge. Sort of. Sprinting is a mechanic in Genshin Impact that functions pretty much exactly like it does in Breath of the Wild, except for one key difference. Your sprint starts off with a little dash forward. This tiny little dash has a few frames of invulnerability. That is your dodge. I don't know if I can fully articulate how terrible this is. It's one of those things that just, oh, just feels wrong, but just looks like regular bad. Not only is your dodge linked to another mechanic, but by being based on iframes, it means it is very hard to tell if you've done it right, or if it will last long enough. This uncertainty only adds to how on the rails the combat feels. You see, Ocarina of Time had a dodge feature, and it worked really well. Added to the dynamism of combat, made the aesthetic aspect of fighting feel more intense and cinematic, with both enemies and the player flinging themselves through the air. However, you might have already seen this coming. The reason Genshin can't do anything like this, I omitted a few details. See, Targeting wasn't just about facing the direction of your enemy, it is so much more. It was a complete overhaul of your controls. It naturally shifts them into a more combat-focused mode. It opens up the possibility for so many different mechanics, but it does it in such a smart way that all of these new controls make perfect sense for the buttons they're mapped to. The control stick previously would move Link forward in whatever direction was held. Link would turn his entire body and move in that direction. When targeting, however, he would sidestep without turning. Targeting 
an enemy or object allows Link to circle around it using left and right, and close or widen the gap with back and forward. The A button, which previously performed a quick evasive roll, now acts as a button to jump in whatever direction is being held. A dodge button. Genshin Impact necessarily cannot do this. There are no modifiers to the core controls. It is a static, unchanging moveset that has to be designed in a way that fits every scenario. Unfortunately, it fails miserably at that. Z-targeting also modifies your attacks. Through various combinations of the stick and target, Link's attacks change. Her standard swipe to overhead swings or stabs with a few variations thereof. Genshin Impact doesn't have that. Its characters are limited to one combo, one charged attack and two specials. This gets pretty repetitive. All you can really do is click the enemy until they fall down and periodically pressing E and Q when charged. There is very little nuance and variety even allowed. Animation fatigue is strong with this one. The combat can be kind of fun when you've got all your stuff charged and there's just an ungodly amount of colourful explosions to distract you from the fact that there's nothing actually here mechanically. Even better when you have a good variety of characters. Specifically new 5 stars as anyone else is pretty samey. Like in Breath of the Wild there are various different weapon types. Swords, bows, claymores, pole arms, and catalyst, Which are either books or weird vague shapes. This is where Genshin Impact differs, but like not really. Instead of having each character be able to use each weapon type, it limits them to different characters. While I completely understand the idea behind this, it does add to the repetitiveness already inherent to the game, where each character can only do their one thing, and that's it. Granted, there are a lot of characters, but a lot of them are very samey. There are unique and even fun characters, but you'll note they're very new. In comparison, the cast of the earlier versions kind of blend into each other and use their weapons in very similar ways. Getting good weapons feels great, in any game really, but you might notice something. In Genshin Impact, once you get one, you might slowly realise that you're still useless. What's going on? Well, you see, regardless of what level you are, upon acquiring a new weapon, you are starting from square one. Or should I say, level one. It is annoying, to say the least. But, uh, it's not a huge deal. Upgrading your weapon is pretty simple. You can use other weapons as material, but it's basically pointless unless you need to get rid of some. Instead, you use these gems. They are everywhere! So much so that you have more of the valuable gems than you do the weaker ones. Why? It's just strange to have more 3-star than 2 or 1. Whatever. Just throw in a few gems. You probably have hundreds by now and then- oh. That's right, your leveling up is stopped in its tracks because it is ascension time. This requires certain materials, some of which spawn naturally, but most of which are exclusively from domains. This game's shrines, sort of. Because god forbid we actually use this map for fucking anything. No no, just put in a barren, boring fucking arena. That's cool, yeah. You're supposed to farm the materials by repeating the exact same fight over and over and over until you've saved up enough to ascend. Once you do, you get the opportunity to do it again! Six more fucking times! With increasingly rare materials because fuck you! So send away and get ready to throw more gems at the fucking- Huh? Adventure rank too low. Oh, for fuck. So what is adventure rank? Adventure Rank or AR is a progression system in the game that is essentially like leveling up the player. No, not the characters, not the traveler, their XP is separate. Instead, it's like an XP system exclusively for you. MiHoYo knows how much XP you have. They're watching you. They know how many hit points you have, fucker. This detached leveling system means a bunch of fun things. For example, there are so many features you are completely locked away from, like fucking multiplayer, and of course, leveling up your weapons, which requires you to do a bunch of shit in an attempt to level up your adventure ranks so you can have the opportunity to spend more resources on your weapon. It also locks you out of progressing through the main fucking story, but oh boy, we'll talk about that! As you progress through the adventure ranks, you realize that once again you're stopped dead in your tracks. It's time to level up your fucking world level. What is world level? World level is another roadblock you have to clear through specific, very well designed quests. After which, all the enemies in the world are now stronger. Pause for dramatic effect- oh fuck. This is unbelievably bad. So terrible that it is almost funny. It might not initially seem obvious why it's so shockingly shit, but let's just break it down. Breath of the Wild is a pretty similar system, but just infinitely better. On the surface, this may seem almost identical. You need to rack up enough XP until a certain threshold in which the enemies are made stronger and the items you find more valuable. However, this is the key difference that sets Breath of the Wild above Genshin Impact. It's an invisible system. 
system. It works naturally into the game's progression and never halts it, ever. Rather than being purely about collecting experience points, Breath of the Wild system is far more about experiences. The game forces you to actually prove yourself as capable and as worthy of the next stage. There is no obvious bar to fill up, no specific XP items, just you and your own capabilities. You gain an invisible XP for doing major things, for slaying major foes, and it can't be farmed either. You can't just kill the same enemy over and over again because that's not really gaining experience, is it? It's just exploiting a system. This feature is so well hidden, so naturally embedded into Breath of the Wild as a game, that people didn't even fully know how it worked or even that it existed. People thought the increase in rare items was just because they cleared the Divine Beasts, but no, it's just that the boss fights gave a lot of invisible XP. The other thing it doesn't do is directly scale enemies to the player. It might make intuitive sense to always keep the enemies at the level of the player so they always have a fair challenge. And my response to that is, why is Todd Howard watching my videos? In a notoriously shit piece of game design, Bethesda's first Fallout game, Fallout 3, scaled everything to the player at all times. This means that every single thing was doable. No challenge too easy, but never insurmountable either. At any point, in any place, this turned the capital wasteland from a harsh violent hellscape into a fun post-apocalyptic Americana theme park to blow stuff up in. Even at that, it's pretty fucking draining to never really get to see the fruits of your labour, as the enemies are always just in and around your level. It means that you get more powerful, and so do they, so it's basically like nothing happened at all. Right from the start of the game, you can walk up to an armed combatant with a fucking baseball bat and just win. You win that fight! Unlike that other game that exists and I'm supposed to really like on account of my gender identity. In that game, it actively uses difficult enemies as a guide for the player, naturally pushing them onto the intended path. Hold up! There are death claws all over the damn place. And you can wait until you're naturally stronger from playing the game and come back. But if you want, you can ignore that and still push forward on raw skill or pure dumb luck. It never directly locks you out, but trusts the player in deciding which challenges they think they can face. In Breath of the Wild, it is also worth mentioning that the enemies don't exactly just scale via matching the players linearly. Instead of numerical levels, they're split into different types, red, blue, black and silver, with silver being the strongest. This means that silver is as strong as they get, and they do not get stronger. They don't scale any further. If you learn how to kill them efficiently, then you're sorted. You're rewarded for learning the game. Another key point is that unlike Genshin Impact, it does not replace all the pre-existing enemies. You can still find plenty of red, blue, and black enemies after the silver starts cropping up. This. Now this is an important bit. This actually lets the player see how far they've come, how powerful they are now. It allows the player to really feel their progress as they can now humiliate enemies that once gave them trouble. This is unlike Fallout 3, and absolutely unlike Genshin Impact. But you know it gets worse, right? You see, unlike Fallout 3, Genshin Impact's enemies don't scale to the level of the player, no no no, they scale to the world's level. Which means, I fucking kid you not, the ultimate goal, the ultimate reward, isn't to outclass your enemies, but literally to be as powerful as them. The big end game is to just recreate the Fallout 3 problem where you're just at the same level as standard nobody enemies and bosses alike because you reach the cap and nothing changes. Alright, we can finally fully upgrade our weapons and get back to talking about the combat. Great! We have our fully upgraded weapon and we still suck. Oh, fucking idiot I am. I forgot about character XP. It's actually a pretty similar system where you use these notes to gain XP. That's actually a really neat detail where the reason you gain XP is because there's the writing of travelers and heroes before you. So you're literally learning off them and it's really cool and- Oh, fuck. It's the same fucking system again. Again, same problems, more rare fucking items, adventure rank requirements and all. Literally the exact same fucking thing. But after all that, everything, every boss killed 300 times, you are kind of okay. Because guess what? Artifacts. Artifacts? What the fuck are these? That's right, it is fucking artifact time, baby. They're the real bread and butter of character building and Fuck me, that is a lot of information. This may seem overwhelming at first, and that's because it is. Thankfully, artifacts are capped off at level 12 and not 90, but good luck getting there! Unlike weapons or characters, the dedicated artifact XP material is so much rarer. It also wasn't even in the fucking game at first, which means you will spend most of your time burning through less valuable artifacts for XP. Gaining valuable ones also isn't as simple, neither is trying to get a full set bonus. If you manage it, gain a full set bonus on a fully upgraded set, of five star items. Congratulations. 
You're like still not done. You still you still suck. You forgot about the talents, you fool. Talents are like your attacks and abilities, and you gotta use your resources to level them up. And there's a lot of them, and a lot of levels, and a lot of necessary materials. After all that, you're good. Finally, you're okay. Oh wait, never mind. You forgot about the constellation, you actual moron. You simpleton. You. How could you forget about that? It's pretty simple too. You just got. Just got a. Oh, constellation upgrades require you to unlock a character again. One for each fucking constellation level. Are you fucking joking? Do you have any idea? How much money this is costing you? Any at all? So much. Because for whatever goddamn reason, every upgrade requires money too. Not just materials, you're fucking cash too. More is plentiful, but it makes it so when you do run out, just extra infuriating. It doesn't even make any sense. What are you spending money on? Why does reading the notes you collected cost money? After all this, you're okay with one character, just one, and every single character needs a different combination of materials and lots of resources and artifacts and their essence and talents and Jesus fucking Christ. You might think that this is intentional, forcing the player to really gain a connection to their character, get them to think, explore the world, gain a PhD in the game's mechanics to meticulously build your character to your specifications. But I actually heavily doubt this, and here's why. For one, it is extremely linear, there is absolutely no personalization here, outside of the weapon you choose, which we'll get to. It is just a scale from weak to powerful with no deviations, no alternate paths. The second, much more obvious point is that, you know, it's not some fucking niche strategy game. It's a very popular work with a huge casual audience. It isn't supposed to be like this. It isn't puff, easy to learn, hard to master gameplay. It's just bad game design. This isn't to mention that the further in you are, it makes new characters fucking unusable until you level them up fully. Just terrible design. It's not a money thing. They're supposed to make me want the new characters to pay for them. If you make them essentially sitting ducks until I go through hell doing the exact same process I've done 15 times already, and it isn't very fucking appealing. And by the way, I'm talking about real money this time, not fucking Mora. Finally, we can continue talking about the combat. But first, let's see what celebrity guest Mark Wahlberg thinks about this. Hey guys, it's me, Mark Wahlberg from Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. I've been invited here to say that I think the Genshin Impact combat isn't very good and has a lot of flaws actually. Alright guys, make sure to download the Catholic app. The weapons of Genshin Impact are very... fine. Their designs are pretty bland. A feature I genuinely really enjoy is the fact that as you upgrade weapons, they gradually change look. It's like, wow, really cool, unironically, good job guys, you did one thing right. They're very blocky and sometimes have questionable design choices, but they are mostly fine, just fine. They're missing something though. They have no weight, no physicality, no presence. They are an extension of the character and not their own object. Take. Breath of the Wild. Each weapon has weight, literally. Big weapons topple enemies over, drag them off the ground and into the air. Blunt weapons smash and edge weapons cut. Wooden weapons burn and float while the metal weapons sink and conduct electricity. It feels like Link actually has the weapon, is using it and the traits that come along with it. While in Genshin Impact, each weapon is merely a stat difference. The character uses it all the same. Weapons aren't even shown on characters. They awkwardly float around when inactive before disappearing, further distancing them from the character. Unlike Link, it also doesn't make a lot of sense that these characters would be using any of these weapons, because they canonically have signature ones instead, but you don't get to use them. There also isn't a lot of unique weapons with properties outside of does more damage. There are some, like how the Dragon Spine Spear drops an icicle that doesn't it doesn't do ice damage, it just does regular damage. So really, it's just a weapon that does more physical damage. <sighs> Great job! Oh, that's right, I haven't talked about the elements, have I? They are as follows. Animo, Geo, Electro, Dendro, Hydro, Pyro, and Cryo. God, they really stretched some of these to get them to rhyme. They're supposed to react to each other in interesting ways, but they mostly manifest as, wow, more damage now. Unlike, you know, Breath of the Wild which they rip this off from. In that game, it's like fun and naturalistic, while in Genshin Impact, it's just, eh. In the recent Zelda games, electricity causes enemies to be stunned and drop their weapons, fire causes them to freak out and try and extinguish the flames, ice freezes them solid, and bombs. In Genshin Impact, there really aren't any of these reactions, they just take the damage. 
When there are elementally charged enemies in the recent Zelda games, which there are, they actually just fucking evaporate when the opposite element is used on them. It's really cool stuff. There is no way to really get good at Genshin Impact without just getting better numbers. That's all. There is nothing to master. In Breath of the Wild, one of the ways in which it rewards the player for learning the game is through timing. You can dodge perfect and start a special attack. This also goes for parrying, a perfect piece of game design, in which any attack, big or small, can be parried by any shield no matter how shitty if you time it just right. A huge risk reward that feels fantastic to pull off. It's so satisfying to launch a laser right back at a guardian. It's genuinely joyful to master and expands your capabilities in combat tenfold. To explain the dichotomy between Breath of the Wild and Genshin Impact, we borrow some terminology from MMOs. Horizontal versus Vertical Progression There are different ideas as to what this means, but for our purposes, we'll call it stats versus capabilities. Genshin Impact is pretty much exclusively vertical progression. Numbers are everything, it is all stats and percentages. Compare that directly to Breath of the Wild, which has both. As you progress through the game, Link gains new abilities that expand what he can do both in combat and traversal. It also has straight up numerical progression, with increasingly strong weapons. Breath of the Wild constantly forces forces the player to adapt. It requires some level of creativity and understanding of how things work, but there is nothing to adapt to in Genshin Impact. It is the same thing every time, no matter what. Which leads us to enemies. Genshin Impact has a wide variety of very unique enemies. They got the basic, semi-smart, animalistic, short, chubby, goblin-esque creature with clubs who have a separate, much faster attack when their clubs are set on fire, they have the much bigger version who uses the same suffix as the previous enemy and wields heavy weapons easier. You got elementally charged slimes, elemental floating wizards with wands and weirdly high-pitched voices who teleport and bounce around, ancient powerful robots with a big eye weak spot that stuns them when shot, and even an organized group of mass thieves that disappear in smoke instead of dying. The enemies are unbelievably spongy and unreactive. They are upright poles designed to be hit and that's it. Unlike Breath of the Wild, which has its enemies always reacting, with you, with other NPCs, with the environment, they're weighty, detailed and have behaviors to learn, to exploit. The Hillitrill simply kinda stands around or does a pre-programmed scripted bit, but it is a lot of f***ing around. Remember that bit about fire weapons? That's a fucking enemy type. While in Breath of the Wild it happens dynamically when a weapon is set on fire. Parrying or electrocuting can cause an enemy to drop their weapon, and they will actually look around for something to defend themselves with, whether it be the weapon they just dropped, or literally anything they can find. This is dynamism in the simplest sense, a fight can play out in a multitude of different ways, in a way that Genshin Impact couldn't even dream of. The way encounters are designed aids in this, with unique structures and set pieces rather than just standing around. There isn't much peace and quiet in Genshin Impact. There are enemies everywhere and there's no alertness system. It is binary. They either see you or they don't and they just won't leave you alone. There is no real time to soak in the world. This alertness is also why the enemies in camps essentially just activate in a really jarring way. Literally going from sleeping to fully upright in a fraction of a second. It's so lame. In Breath of the Wild you can exploit enemy alertness with distractions. Sounds, food to grab. It's why you can silently and quickly take out enemies in the night while they sleep, or sneak up behind them. Some of the enemy design is more egregious than the rest. Let's talk about the rune guards. Oh for fuck. These are your guardians, except not really. Rather than being these imposing, terrifying mechanical creatures that stalk around the map, they're just, like, a really big guy. The guardians are relatively simple, only having one attack, but it's the presentation that makes them. The guardians are petrifying because I mean look at them. They run around and move so erratically. They forgo the natural and fluid movement of everything else in the world and are jumpy and snappy. They jut out so strongly in a world of barbaric monsters, of swords and shields and small fantasy towns. They're cold, mechanical, futuristic. They shoot laser beams. It is almost surreal in how it functions, out of this world, out of this era, like an invasion from the future. It really gives off the impression that this. These robots are what ended the world. Their theme is also the de facto panic song across the internet. The rune guards on the other hand suck. They're so poorly designed, man. Rather than being out in the open, they normally congregate in arena-like areas. And when they don't, somehow their design only gets worse. So they're huge spongy robots with both melee and ranged attacks. I swear, I can't prove this, but I'm almost certain that these fucking missiles are predetermined whether they hit you or not before fire. I swear to god. I actually get this feeling from a lot of projectiles in the game where it seems like they have to curve around and move unnaturally to hit you, as if the game already decided that you were going to get hit before you had a chance to do anything. The rune guards have this spin attack that goes on for a long time, does a lot of damage, takes up a lot of space, and juggles your character with no invincibility frames. They can also knock you out of the arena in which, guess what, you were registered as having left the fight and the enemy resets and gains all of his health. Yeah, this is an issue. In Breath of the Wild, using your environment is really important, as previously mentioned. A really great way to kill someone is to throw them off a fucking 
Flying Cliff. You can't really do this in Genshin Impact. While fall damage does exist, it doesn't fucking matter because guess what? These dickheads just come back. Fully healed. Want to heal your wounds? Jump off a cliff. Not you. I'm sorry. Is that a fucking gun? The Fatui are, uh, something. They're like villains, I think. They want the Gnosis. Gnosis? They want the this, which are just the Chaos Emeralds. There's literally seven of them. They do not fit the world. But Kai, you said that was a good thing. I know, but the Guardians are a literal world-ending force. That is what they fucking did. The Fatui just have rifles and are simply more advanced than everyone else, and that's just grand. They're actually very fun to fight until the- oh no. This is a shield. It's a pretty nifty little thing. It protects you from shit, you know. Genshin Impact does not have shields, which is fine. The combat in the game is significantly more aggressive and less strategic, and we've been through this. That being said, everybody else gets shields. As if Genshin Impact's gallery of glorified sponges weren't bad enough, now they get to extend their health bar to hell and back. Actually, not back, just, just to hell and then way more forwarder. Back to the real video game now. Shields are once again physical objects, ones that have weight and unique properties. They can be shocked, burnt, and wiped out of people's hands. They can also be avoided by attacking an enemy when their guard is down, or staggering them off balance, or using the perfect dodge, etc. The game presents you with a problem and then lets you figure out how to deal with it. As per usual, Genshin Impact has one solution. For a moment, let's talk about one of my favourite games of all time. Resident Evil 2. Look, I don't think I'm ever gonna get a chance to talk about this. It's not a very video essay type of fucking video game, alright? Leave me alone. If Genshin Impact is scared little Leon Kennedy, patrolling the halls of the RPD trying to find the exact correct colour key to progress, then Breath of the Wild is fucking Mr. X, who when presented with a locked door, punches through the fucking wall. This is actually more apt than you might think. The shields are quite literally mid-combat doors you need the right colour key for. This might be interesting, except it isn't. There are seven elements and only four character slots meaning there's a high chance you'll end up in a situation where no matter how skilled you are, you just can't deal with it. Not without just wailing and waiting to recharge and wailing and oh my. When enemy does have a shield, it has to be burnt away. Or else you have to maneuver around really awkwardly in a way that is clearly not intentional as the enemy awkwardly snaps to wherever you are. This is because they're not physical objects in the world, but just smoke and mirrors, giving a visual reason for a function that makes the enemy invulnerable until set on fire. This is just made significantly worse with elemental shields. These boring, inexplicable orbs or auras that you just gotta deal with. Now, let's talk about my mortal enemy. Why are you here? The Legionnaires are an amazing case study in fucking awful design. They are horrific to fight. All of their attacks are annoying in a way that is extremely obnoxious. For one, they have lots of health, do lots of damage, take up lots of space, and have very unfair attacks. If you get up close, you get shot by an ice throw attack that deals high damage on every frame. If you try use range attacks, he jumps to your exact location, and his fucking shield not only makes him take less damage, not only has a big health bar itself, no no, also makes him do more damage and gives him special attacks while active. What the fuck? Not only is this bad enough, but also, at minimum, you're not just fighting one Fatus, but two Fatui. Alright, okay, sure. The two Legionnaires are Cryo and Hydro and are often paired together, which makes sense as they're the one interesting elemental reaction in the entire game. But that also has its own problems. Together, they're a tag team of fuckery with the single goal of ruining your day. The Cryo Legionnaire is significantly more aggressive and damaging, especially with his shield up, so it makes sense to go after him first. Oh wait, that isn't really an option. Not only is ice significantly more dangerous when you're wet, but guess fucking what? The Hydro Legionnaire has an attack where he shoots another enemy to heal them. Guess we have to go fight the fucking Hydro Legionnaire instead. Oh wait. While you're figuring out which one of these mass spherical bastards to deal with, you've probably been run into a wall by a man with a big hammer. Even if that didn't happen, remember, this is Genshin Impact. It's not your choice to make, fucker. This is a reoccurring issue in the game where enemies are fine on their own, some even have good ideas and fun mechanics, but the second you place them with their enemies, suddenly things start falling apart. It begs the question, did MiHoYo never playtest any of these outside of a one-on-one -on -one fight? Oh my god, it really feels like the extent of their testing was spawning an enemy in one of their many boring arenas and just said, Yep and called it a fucking day. The closest thing to interacting these cardboard boxes have is the aforementioned healing the Hydro Gutter does. This is unlike in Breath of the Wild in which you get it. This isn't even to mention the fact that even fucking ice is worse. 
In the most recent Zelda games, getting hit with an ice attack gets you frozen. You can try to break free or get involuntarily broken out by an attack that will do critical damage and make you fall over as the ice shatters. In Genshin Impact, getting frozen requires both water and ice, and when you do, not only do you take a lot of damage, but you continue to be frozen and can just get hit over and over again until you break yourself free. Ah. Uh. Fairness, my favorite. This is made even shittier by the fact that a lot of the time getting frozen is redundant. Whatever do you mean, Kai? Well, what have I told you that to achieve what is essentially the same effect, you only need hydro? Welcome to Bubbles. Bubbles, the most seemingly innocent of attacks. No! These fucking things are the exact same as being frozen, if not worse. Because these bastards literally track you down, sometimes to trap you, which deals a shocking amount of damage in its own right, and then you're left vulnerable, and with the wet status applied, which means if, say, there was a Hydro Abyss Mage and a Cryo Abyss Mage, you could, you know, break free from the Hell Bubble to immediately be frozen. That wouldn't be very fun. Speaking of ice, Dragon Spine had the potential to be really cool. Added at 1.2, it turns the glaring, egregiously low-poly mountain into an actual place, with a very unique look for the game. It is freezing, sub-zero, and just like in Breath of the Wild, you have to deal with that. Unlike that game, however, the cold is a bar that builds underneath your health, and when it fills up, starts doing substantial damage. There are no cold animations either. Not really a surprise. This is... Way worse than you might think it is. Just like in Breath of the Wild, you can fight off the freezing cold with fire. However, unlike that game, you can't light your own fires, and you can only use pre-placed environmental sources of heat. Some of them don't even make sense. Even though Breath of the Wild does allow you to light your own fires as well as use pre-existing ones, that's not the most practical way of fighting the cold. Wearing warm clothes or eating spicy food is the main way. There are cool other options too, like using a fire weapon. In Genshin Impact, you can literally be on fire and still freeze. Great job, guys. However, this raises another problem. For some reason, most elements in the game put out fires. I don't know why. Which means if you're fighting near a fire, you know, to avoid freezing to death mid-fight, chances are it's going to be put out by something. Okay, so just relight it with a fire attack. Oh, wait. So, here's an issue. Remember, you can't control where you hit, meaning if an enemy is nearby, you will lock onto them instead. Which means the only way to continue to survive is a charge shot from a pyro bow character. That means Amber. Amber is universally considered one of, if not objectively, the worst character in the entire fucking game. Oh my god! Now, you might be saying, well, Kai, what about characters like Yomiya and that uh, twink? They're significantly more useful pyro bow characters that hold up well both in combat and as utility to light fires. Just one tiny little issue. Completely ignoring the fact that those characters were acquired from limited time-only banners, they didn't even exist when Dragonspine was created. They're both entire full number versions away from Dragonspine. Amber, on the other hand, was the only one that existed at the time and was literally given to you for free. Meaning she's clearly the intended person for the fucking job. I love Amber, she's actually one of my favorite characters because I'm boring. But even I recognize she's not exactly who you want on your team after the very start, and especially not in an environment as grueling as this. This whole issue could be fixed with some Z-targeting. This would never be an issue with a Zelda game because if you're not targeting anything, then your swing goes in the direction you're facing. Simple as, Genshin Impact has you, instead, awkwardly turn to whichever guy it assumes you should hit, and there you go. Unless you're, of course, using bows. The bow is so much better from a game design perspective that it's a little funny. While yes, they have the extremely generic combo attack, they also have this fun little thing called a charged attack, which actually now acts as aiming. Full player control, full player agency. You get to choose who to hit and when and where to hit them. It even rewards the player for their aim, doing critical damage and even causing enemies to fall over when struck with a headshot. A feature lifted directly from Breath of the Wild. You even get to choose whether to wait for a fully charged shot that does more damage and is elementally charged, or rapid fire weaker normal arrows that deal physical damage. This is insane. Did they actually make a video game? Yeah, sort of. Sure, it feels a bit lame. 
They did it! They managed to make something actually engaging. Something that genuinely rewards strategic and skillful play. Sure, I'm also pretty sure that their hit scan rather than actual projectiles, which might explain why some other projectiles feel like they're predetermined whether they hit you or not. Maybe the hit scan is misaligned so the bow doesn't actually fire from where it should and they just haven't fixed it yet. I'm not even scratching the surface here. There are hundreds of little problems that add up to be gigantic issues. It's a lack of polish in every way. It is just lazy, simple as. I don't want to shame the development team because really, I'm not sure who to blame for this. But somebody messed up massively somewhere. Let's talk briefly about the wiki wild wild west. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a great example of some of the best and worst that open world game design has to offer. It has this really interesting thing which I like to call exaggerated naturalism, where the game keeps visual shorthand to a minimum. It's also embedded directly into the art direction. It's one of the most detailed games ever made, still five years later. This naturalism means Arthur needs to be able to do a lot of different things on the fly to seem real, to seem like he's actually there, but to also give the player control. This is mostly done through, oh my god, it's fucking Z-Target. This allows Arthur to talk to people, to engage with his environment, to fight, to rob, turning jump into a dive. You miss out on so much flexibility with your mechanics like this. Red Dead Redemption 2 is at minimum two separate games. There's Red Dead Redemption 2, the open world sandbox with light survival elements like cooking, crafting, weight and disease management, horse care, and hunting, anything can happen and there are a myriad of places to explore, things to see. Then, there's Red Dead Redemption 2, the linear Naughty Dog style roller coaster game, a much more cinematic and story driven approach with no room for choice. These are at odds with each other, exact opposites really. True freedom is immediately replaced with strict linearity the second you start a mission. This is bad open world game design. You sometimes have to just ask. Why is this an open world? A massive problem in our good old friend, Genshin Impact. The game never justifies its own existence, not in the way that the recent Zelda games do. Those games are open worlds necessarily. The amount of personal freedom they offer a player would be wasted on something more linear. You never get the chance to really test the game out, push the world to its limits, explore and experiment. Hell, even extremely linear games also have more freedom than Genshin Impact. Resident Evil 4 2023 rewards the player constantly for actually thinking about things like a person would. A fucking course, a rocket launcher or a few grenades would break a wall faster than an uncle qualified 20 year old manning a fucking wrecking ball. There are a myriad of examples of this. My personal favourite is, don't want to get dropped down into a room of bloodthirsty cultists who are about to transform into head eating monsters that have to go through everyone just to get back to the lever to raise the bridge once it's all over? Just fucking blind the guy manning the lever. There. Encounter skipped. Holy shit. Genshin Impact has absolutely none of this clever intuitive design and nowhere is this more clear than in the domains. Domains are this game's equivalent to both shrines and dungeons. In the recent Zelda games, shrines are really interesting. The narrative contract we accept is that these shrines are there to test the hero's abilities, but it is loose. They are pure ludic spaces, a moment to forgo the naturalism of the game's world for a pure gameplay experience. They remind me of test maps, spaces designed so that the game's mechanics can come to fruition in a really clear way, unobstructed by realism or a need for explanations. This gives the developers so much freedom, now unbound by having to feel like a place that could plot possibly exist, they can play around with the mechanics in unique ways, present challenges. Tears of the Kingdom ups this even further by putting player freedom and creative thinking into the forefront. It gives you in-house solutions, but they're never a requirement. We're so used to games holding our hands and guiding us through precise, crafted experiences that people actually thought the game was broken, that it felt like cheating and that the mechanics were a flaw with the puzzles and not their strength. You give players some free will and they get scared and think they've wronged you somehow. The vast majority of your time in domains will be in carbon copy arenas fighting a seemingly random, unthought about selection of enemies before your reward of some materials. When there are interesting mechanics or locales, they are separate from the actual world. While I did previously highlight the contrast between the shrines and the world, it doesn't mean they are entirely separate. The mechanics found within the shrines are the same mechanics found in Hyrule. They are not just unique gameplay experiences, but they also act as natural tutorials for the wider world. Genshin Impact doesn't have this. It has mechanics that are so obtuse, unnatural, and gimmicky that it has to have a comically long tutorial list. Now you might say, that's not that bad. Plenty of games have tutorials like this, even your beloved Breath of the Wild. But those are very optional, tucked away and typically they're not this fucking long. I don't particularly like those either, but like, it makes sense as a refresher. Genshin Impact is so bad at teaching you things that it literally has to coax the player into reading its numerous tutorials by offering premium currency. They also, unlike other games, have a constant red notification exclamation mark on your screen until you finally give in and read their shit. This is because the game cannot teach you 
do anything naturally because it doesn't know how. Genshin Impact's quest design is, okay, like it is literally everything wrong I've already mentioned. It would be really redundant to go through it because it is literally just linear sequences of everything I've already spoken about, except for one thing, but we're not there yet. In his video Manufactured Discontent, Dan Olson of Folding Ideas talks about Fortnite. There's a part I want to highlight. This describes Genshin Impact perfectly. The game is full of weird, unpolished edge cases like vehicles all using slightly different control schemes even for shared functionality. Not even all the doors in the game work the same. I wish I was joking. The game's event system is great. Countless hours spent developing entire maps, modes, minigames and game mechanics that are going to be discarded in about a week. It's pretty miserable. As a result, they lack polish because, well, they're gonna be gone anyway. You have to wonder just what exactly the point is. So many ideas thrown away. Some make it back into the main game, but most don't. It's just odd. It is a lose-lose scenario. You have to put a lot of time, work, and money into something like this. But due to how disposable it is, there's no real point in polishing things, especially when the majority of your player base probably aren't going to get a chance to even experience it, especially when those events are locked behind other actual quests or ranks and shit. Why is it like this? However, the most egregious and vile things these events do is actually be good or interesting, because soon they'll be gone. You're entering my realm now. I have been editing for three days straight. Um, or is it four? I don't know. I've kind of lost count. I have a bit of time off and I've used it exclusively for this. Um, in 51 minutes, it is going to be Christmas Eve. So if you celebrate Christmas, uh, Merry Christmas, it'll probably be uploaded Christmas Eve. Uh, for me, not for you guys. You guys are probably still going to get it on the 23rd because you're most likely an American and you're a few hours behind me. Um, so what do we do with the intermission? I usually like to show off fan art. Um, I don't think I've gotten any in time if I have, and I've missed it. I'm so fucking sorry. I will include it definitely in the next one. Just ping me in case I've missed any. But typically this is where I'd show off um, art if I do have it. And it's also where I advertise the server and other things. Um, so you're about to see the advertisement, which is probably the last time I'm ever going to play this adverse. I'm going to make a new one for the next video, but I don't have the time. I do not have the time. So, you know, happy holidays, everybody. I know that the holidays can be tough for a lot of people. Um, so I hope that this video <laughs> serves as a good distraction in case your family is like racist or something, which is unfortunately common. Next time, I'm not going to make a video this long, so um, I guess get ready for an advertisement. Has this ever happened to you? Oh god, oh me, I'm just, I'm just ever so lonely. Oh no, I don't have any friends. That's great then you need to join the Guys Home for Aspiring Vampires server. Wow! It has such great features, such as the ability to send messages, and also images, video, and sound. Call your friends. Who needs a phone when you have the Guys Home for Aspiring Vampires community server? Oh my god! Finally, the Home for Aspiring Vampires is now a real place that you can go to, and... I'll be a vampire, I guess I'm so tired. We have such great features, like amazing emotes and fun commands. Carl, show me Leon Kennedy falling down, please. Carl, behead my father. What? So make sure that you leave your money in my pocket and join the Kai's home for his spot. Oh my god, my life is over! That's right, we're finally talking about the store wishes. Using premium currency either bought or earned, the player can use the gacha system. Named after gashapon toy vending machines, essentially you put in your currency and get out a random reward or set of rewards. It's fine. No, seriously, it's just... okay. Whenever I see criticism of this game, 99% of the time they complain about this system. It really isn't that bad and, and is far from the most predatory monetization scheme for a free-to-play game like this. I'm not defending it, not really. It's pretty usable as a free-to-play though. 
Regardless, I hate how this takes away from real criticism of the game. Nobody talks about the game, nobody gives real critique of the story, gameplay, or art direction. They only talk about the anime man slot machine. Genshin Impact opens with the two travellers, Lumine and Aether, their siblings who travel from worlds to worlds. However, one day, uh, something bad happens and they're separated from each other. Oh, no. This is all exposition rather than just having the events of the game happen, which they also kind of do. The game doesn't let you even think about what happened, you get told. Sick still image, guys. Just absolutely sick still image. A while ago, the Traveller fished out this game's navi, named Paimon, and they become friends or whatever. Wow, this cutscene sure is really well animated and expressive. Sets a great precedent going forward. The Traveller, who I will be calling Lumine for the rest of the video because if you picked Ether, you're wrong, resonates with Anima, one of the main elephants. <laughs> Are you fucking serious, dog? There's no way I said one of the main elephants. One of the main elements, also known as Wind. She does this via one of the Statue of the Seven, a monument to one of the Seven Gods of Tevat. This one being Barbados, the God of Winds. The opening of the game is actually pretty good, as we get a bunch of nice dynamic cutscenes and introductions to the characters of Mondstadt, the city of like, five different unrelated things. And it's fun, and very and even intriguing. The Knights of Avonia can help with Dvalin, a giant dragon terrorizing them, and can't help Lumine find her brother while they're preoccupied with that. Barbados is revealed to be taking the form of a human in Venti, and the rest of Prologue plays out, and it's fine, it's nice. After saving the city, the evil Fatui come out and steal Venti's Chaos Emeralds, oh no! And then the game can really begin. Oh. So Genshin Impact has this really great system where you cannot continue to play the fucking game until you reach a certain adventure rank. Invested in the story where you get fucked. <laughs> this is such a terrible thing to do. The reward for completing a big quest should also be the ability to do the next one. This is terrible pacing. I cannot fathom why anyone would do this. Fenty doesn't know shit about the god that took Aether, but suggests one of the other gods instead, Morax in Liyue. Lumine goes to meet with him, only for him to immediately die, making her a major suspect. Show killing cops montage here. Oh, I wasn't supposed A ginger fuck named, uh, Child? Ch Chilled? Aids Lumine in her attempt to clear her name. Just from an optics perspective, maybe she shouldn't have, uh, killed all those people? He introduces Lumine to Zhongli, who I'm sure isn't important, and uh-oh, turns out Child is here for that chaos emerald, that fucking cunt. Uh-oh. God is here, they save the day, turns out Zhongli is also that god, and Lumine isn't a murderer of him. <laughs> Zhongli tells Lumine to go to Inazuma, but first, the Abyss Order, who are a thing, apparently. Lumine is supposed to meet with, hold on a second, Byakuya Togami needs her help in taking down some plans the Abyss Order had, and, oh no, her sibling, I forgot about him, he's fucking evil now, bastard. <laughs> Off to Inazuma, where things get... Oh god. It was here that everything clicked into place. The moment that kills Genshin Impact for me. These problems all existed before, but there was always something to distract me. But with this, every issue was so clear. It was Genshin Impact's raw nerve, stripped away to its core. A rotten core. Genshin Impact's storytelling, uh, is abysmal. Or- Oh, or should I say, abysmal? Alright, thanks, I'll be here all night. Uh, make sure to download the Catholic- It is shocking. We've had- Decades of storytelling and games to learn from, yet Genshin Impact does so much wrong. I complained a lot about the gameplay, but at the end of the day, I'm happy to put up with it to see silly anime characters in bright flashy colours and elemental explosions. That stuff can be really fun sometimes, despite how flawed the game is. This, however, is pretty unforgivable. When I say that Red Dead Redemption 2 was split into two different games, I considered that piss poor design. But at least those two games are engaging. No matter which one you choose to focus on in the moment, they are both independently well designed, even if they don't mix. Genshin Impact storytelling, however, is in many ways the worst aspect. Let's start off with the least consequential things, shall we? Genshin Impact's world and the things you do in it are even more separated than Red Dead Redemption 2. They are only tangentially related. To understand this fully, you have to go and crank the pretentious meter up to fucking overdrive. In 2007, Clint Hawking invented games criticism when they coined the term ludonarrative dissonance while critiquing Bioshock. If you're like me, you're already rolling your eyes, and if you're even more like me, you're overjoyed and an excuse to discuss this topic in current year without embarrassment. 
To boil it down to the simplest terms, it refers to when a game's actual narrative and its gameplay tell different stories, when they don't connect, when they outright conflict each other. The most obvious example I give is Ubisoft's only good game, the criminally underrated Watch Dogs 2. The story is about a group of quirky hacktivists with their action man and player character Marcus Holloway backflipping his way through Silicon Valley's predatory tech industry. Oh, I ran out of oxygen. It is very lighthearted, very goofy, and incentivizes non-lethal stealth gameplay using Marcus's stun gun. However, as a player, you can choose to not do that. Pick up an enemy weapon and fucking go to town. And it is, admittedly, a lot of fun. However, nothing changes. The fact you took Marcus from a fun-loving hacker standing up for the little guy to a deranged serial killer putting the little guy down doesn't change anything. The game stays the same regardless of how you approach a situation. Genshin Impact's ludonarrative dissonance is much stranger. The game requires you to build a team of characters who are not just random player characters, but people who exist out in the world. Always key story characters who you can meet for the first time, despite them being your seasoned travel companion for months. It is very odd. Why such a core aspect of the game, maybe even the most important part, has no stake in the story is beyond me. Why is it like this? Why can you stand next to the character you are? Why is every feat attributed to the traveller in a game about your team, in a game designed with co-op? That's somehow the least egregious part. That is somehow the part I could live with the most. Let's actually talk about a Genshin Impact tells its story. The cutscenes start off promising, dynamic and in-engine. They add a lot of personality to the characters just by having them move. I sure hope it stays like that. Oh fuck. These cutscenes are bad. They are terrible. They are an elongated sequence of shot reverse shot with a bunch of wooden planks staring at each other, if even that. It is so fucking egregious. It is lazy. It is boring. When there are properly animated cutscenes, a lot of them are pre-rendered, therefore coming with just some gross artifacting that is very avoidable. Plus, they're always used as a crutch, when something would just be a bit too fun. There's a sequence in the Inazuma questline in which you're helping the resistance fight off the Shogun's army, but you get to hit a few people in a really tight arena while everyone else gets to do the cool shit in a pre-rendered cutscene. Just as a teeny bit of advice, Always let the player do the cool things, not Mr. Cutscene Man. I am someone who loves story in games. I have no issue with lots of dialogue, it just has to be interesting. This isn't. Whatever interesting ideas the game presents are extremely undermined by the presentation and the writing. It just isn't up to scratch. Jokes literally never land and rely extremely heavily on catchphrase comedy. Dialogue is often long and unwieldy, but not in a way that feels intentional. Then we have to talk about her, Paimon. How desperately I want to like you, but unfortunately, Amidna, you are not. As far as companion characters go, none are as annoying as Paimon. Navi might overexplain, might interrupt, but Navi never regurgitated information you just learned back at you during an inexplicably long 15 minute cutscene of boring camera shots and a grand total of three possible poses a character might take. The game has no skip button, despite having one in other places, which means button mashing. If I'm desperately trying to skip through a cutscene, it means something is horribly wrong. I love dialogue, I love cutscenes, but these are insane, especially when half of it is redundant or bloated. This much dialogue is unnecessary it only shows how bad the writing is. They need so many words to say so little. Mashing through isn't very quick either, as literally any time a character needs to make a slight movement, you lose the ability to move on to the next dialogue box. You also lose the ability if a dialogue choice is coming up. Okay, so engagement, right? Something to keep things interesting. <laughs> no! 
None of your choices matter. Absolutely none of them. It's all predetermined. Most of them are extremely pointless too. Like why slow down the pacing for this? Why is it like this? However, there is one thing, one thing so much better than anything else in the game that it doesn't even feel like it's made by the same people. I'm talking about hangout events. These fucking things are actually good. Seriously, they solve so many problems the game has that it's crazy. For one, they're heavily focused on these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the characters. They're significantly more expressive and animated and they allow the character's personality and identity to actually shine through for once instead of being tucked away in submenus and ignored by the main story. Story. Your dialogue choices actually matter now and affect things going forward, both in where the quest goes and how the character feels about you. That's right, there are actual branching paths that you can take. Actual player freedom. There are multiple endings, all of which come with adorable photos you can actually download. These help so much in bringing the characters to life and strengthening your connection with them. Plus, they can actually be replayed from any point at any time, which is always nice. But unfortunately, these are a small fraction of the game's quests and are ultimately inconsequential side content with absolutely no effect on the game at all once they're done. The vast majority of the rest of the game and all of the main content is lower quality. All of this wouldn't be nearly as bad if it was just interesting. If the characters had something to say, but Genshin Impact has nothing to say. I want to talk briefly about another Dan Olsen video. I promise I'm not upset. This one about Annihilation really struck me. Olsen talks about people's refusal to engage with stories and metaphor. He talks about ending explain videos and how they took a very literal approach to analysis. The story isn't about anything other than what literally happened. A story is nothing but a timeline of events. This attitude feels so prevalent especially with games, where they're looked at not as whole products, not as a complete fiction, but separated. Gameplay and story are seen as independent, isolated things, not different aspects to an entire narrative. I think lore is killing storytelling. I find a pervasive frame of mind that just having lots of information makes the story more gooder, that nothing about what it says or means matters. Genshin Impact makes a great wiki. The story is a large collection of information that sounds cool when compiled into an article. When people say Genshin Impact has a good story, they mean this. They mean that it has a lot of information, whether they're conscious of it or not. The characters are also like this, they aren't really much other than a vague collection of ideas, of tropes that we expect from an anime inspired game like this. Anything interesting about them is nothing but flavour text, hidden away in a sub menu. You know, speaking of, those characters sure are popular, their designs are mostly… fine. There's a handful that I genuinely like, but a lot of them are best described as fantasy anime noise. Regardless of whether you like the design or not, it kinda doesn't matter, because the character is going to be butchered anyway. These models are… holy shit, they look bad. They look ugly and off-model because they necessarily have to be. You see, Genshin Impact has six model types, which really boil down to three model types, short, medium, and tall. These are the shapes that every single character has to be unnaturally bent into. Most characters are just hair with everything else being painted on. A cast comprised entirely of deviant art OC bases. This means that literally none of the cast has the capability of doing anything other than these three body types no deviations. This was made extra absurd with the release of Arataki Ito, a design that showed so much promise, easily one of their best ever, and most importantly, wasn't a fucking twink. However, as he released, those hopes were dashed as Ito was revealed to be the exact same fucking shape as everybody else with painted on muscles, Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be like this, not at all. This isn't some competitive online game where everyone needs to fit a strict shape to be fair, it literally has no reason to be like this besides laziness. The NPCs fare far worse. They look not only ugly, but completely out of place, with different proportions and they weirdly tower over characters and they all look the fucking same. This looks terrible. It is so bad and of course the only characters who have different body types are NPCs with a face that doesn't match the fucking art style. Genshin Impact has a weirdly inconsistent style. Interiors look completely different to exteriors and each new area gains added visual effects that weren't there previously, and none of them are retroactively put back into the game. A window in Monsat is of a significantly lower quality than one in Fontaine. These new ones have very shoddy interior mapping that makes every room look tiny, but you know, it's something. Fontaine is visual effects that will probably never be added backwards into the game. I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about the fanbase, and to be honest, as I wrote this section, I still wasn't sure, so I compromised. Some of the analysis is being saved for a later video, one that I can't wait to get around to. So the future of Genshin Impact will be really interesting. You see, the game has this massive problem, that being that it's really poorly optimized and extremely bloated, something that is only going to get worse as the game continues to expand. You see, the map is fucking huge, needlessly so, and will only continue to get bigger with time. 
is also just not that functional. With each new country, new jack, weird details are added, the performance issues are inexcusable, and this game of all things should not lag on a PS4. Obviously. What made Genshin Impact so appealing was the accessibility, but they still have two more countries left, and they're already over a hundred gigabytes. I seriously mean it. I'm barely scratching the surface. But this video is already too much for a tiny channel like me to handle, so I have to cut it down somewhere. You might be wondering something. Kai, you've only addressed one part of the title so far. You've only gone over why you can't and never why you want to love Genshin Impact. With all this critique, why do you want to love the game? Well, because of what it represents. What it almost was. My dream game. A Zelda game with all the in-between parts included, countless characters and places to explore, grand big cities with life, an ever-alive, ever-evolving fantasy world full of wonder and intrigue. The game I wanted as a child so bad. It for a brief moment had that spark. It's also because of what it did, got so many people into playing more involved games. So many people who would have never picked up a fucking RPG before, but here they were, engaging with it. I hope those people play other games too. Eventually. I wanted that sense of community, with everybody discussing it in the characters, something to connect with people on. However, I just couldn't do it. It was so insulting to play. I know I've compared it to Zelda a lot, but I don't want it to be a clone. I love when it does unique things, had its own identity, but it borrows so heavily. It's like they base the entire game around a let's play they watched at Breath of the Wild. It's all the visual aspects, but the underlying mechanics are so much worse. And also, the recent Zelda games are just clear case studies in fantastic open world game design. The gold standard. They highlight in every which way Genshin Impact stumbles. How they feel like living, breathing worlds. While Genshin Impact feels like a deeply flawed, linear sequence of trials in a big, grassy basin. I want to love Genshin Impact, and that's why I can't. I've been Kai from Kai's Home for Aspiring Vampires. Also, while I was writing this, they added some weird racist fucking dialogue into the new event or whatever. Fuck you. Play Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs>